It's Sunday, September 16th, 1999, just after 6 p.m. Carnival Cruise Line's MS Tropical is returning to its home port of Tampa, Florida after a four-day cruise to Mexico. The weather is well over 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and activities aboard the self-proclaimed fun ship are continuing as they should. There have been some reports of plumbing problems on this voyage, including overflowing toilets. But Tropical is a 17-year-old ship at this point, and minor maintenance issues are to be expected. As passengers begin ordering their entrees for the 6 p.m. dinner service, an onboard alarm begins to ring. Below the decks of the Tropical, a fire has just started, which is threatening the ship's very electrical and propulsion systems. Suddenly, the ship stops moving. She is powerless and dead in the water. To make things worse, this ship is in the path of an oncoming tropical storm. The Tropical began its service history as a major triumph for the newly established Carnival Cruise Line. After getting its start converting old ocean liners into cruise ships, the company had finally acquired enough funds for a new ship of their own. Her interior design was the first of many for the cruise line to be done by Carnival designer Joe Farkas. Farkas's design language evokes that of a Las Vegas casino, and while it's seen as polarizing today, Tropical was truly Carnival Cruise Line's first opportunity to express themselves as a brand. It was their first ship to have the now iconic winged funnel. Her owners worked to ensure that every inch of this ship would be purposeful and well-designed a benefit of starting with a blank canvas. Tropical was a complete success for Carnival and allowed them to continue building new ships. Tropical was not followed up with sister ships, rather by evolving her design into the holiday class and later fantasy class. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, Carnival managed to expand its fleet from just three aging vessels to a modern fleet of over 15 vessels 12 of which were purpose-built for the line. Tropical continued to do her part in the fleet over the years with little incident. With all this expansion, Carnival began repositioning their older vessels to test out new itineraries, and Tropical was no exception. Ports such as San Juan, New Orleans, and Tampa had been untouched by major cruise lines, but now are massively popular debarkation ports, and they all started as home ports for ships like Tropical. By the late 1990s, Carnival had established itself as a powerhouse in the industry. In 1997, Carnival acquired a majority share in the Italian Costa Cruise Line. In 1998, they acquired a majority share in the prestigious Cunard Line. Their rate of expansion was unprecedented, and major incidents were few and far between. That is, until July 20th, 1998, when the Ecstasy departed the port of Miami, Florida. A fire started in the laundry room and spread through the ventilation system to the stern, where mooring lines ignited. Most of the passengers that we understand were actually from Europe, a good group of them from Holland, not a lot of them understanding exactly what the alarms were for. There were even problems with the speakers on board. They say some didn't work, some actually shorted out when the fire started. So. Six tugboats responded to help fight the fire and tow Ecstasy back to port, as luckily, she was right off the coast. Losses from the fire and associated damages are estimated to have exceeded $17 million. Eight passengers and 14 crew members were injured, and Carnival's fire preparedness was brought into question. While the fire was burning, some of the passengers said they tried to ask crew members what was going on. Oftentimes, they didn't get a response because the crew did not speak English. So, Fires have always been a serious hazard on ships. Ecstasy lacked an automatic fire suppression system in the area in which the fire spread, which could have easily turned into a disaster had she not been so close to the shore. Carnival was growing, their fleet was expanding, and as that happens, the likelihood of incidents increases, and the Ecstasy fire was a bad look for the company. 
After 17 long and reliable years sailing for the Carnival Cruise Line, the Tropical set off for a four-day cruise from Tampa on September 13, 1999. Traveling some 1,400 miles across the Gulf of Mexico, she would take port in Cozumel before returning home. A rather modest itinerary for what was by this point a modest ship. The newest ships of this era were well over 100,000 gross tons, almost triple Tropical's 36,000 gross tons. By this point, she was the oldest ship in Carnival's fleet, as the Mardi Gras, Carnival, and Festival had all been sold off. Tropical may have been purpose-built for cruising, but this was almost 20 years ago, and cruising had gone through massive changes as an industry. Her interior spaces were beginning to show wear, but what's worse were the reported plumbing issues. Larry Clark, a passenger on this particular cruise, was quoted in the Tampa Times as saying, The situation was deplorable. From the moment we got on the boat, our toilet didn't work. We complained to management, and it was never fixed. It is impossible to know for sure whether these rumors of backed up sewage before the power failure were true. It is, however, important to note that around this time, Carnival was looking to sell Tropical. If they were indeed considering selling the ship, it is possible that they were waiting to dry dock the ship and make repairs until plans were finalized, a move which happens often to aging ships. But this is largely conjecture. By September 19th, the ship was just 100 miles southwest of Tampa. The following events are a little muddled, but here's what we know for sure. At 6.15 p.m., a fire broke out in the engine room. Investigators would later estimate the fire to reach anywhere between 900 and 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. It was so intense that the paint on the outside of the ship's hull was singed and blistered. A door to one of the ship's boilers had blown off from the force of the fire, and heavy metal equipment melted into nearly indistinguishable forms. The fire burned so hot, in fact, that the root cause of it remains a mystery to this day, as all the evidence had simply melted away. Almost immediately, crew members were sent to check on alarms that were sounding in the bridge. As the crew fought the flames, there was confusion and some panic among the passengers. The passengers were mustered to their lifeboat stations on Deck 8, where they stood by, ready to abandon ship if need be. Information about the ship burning beneath their feet was scarce. Many had no idea what was going on. To make matters worse, there were some reports of a language barrier between the crew and the passengers, leading to further confusion. While the fire was burning, some of the passengers said they tried to ask crew members what was going on. Oftentimes, they didn't get a response because the crew did not speak English, so... As the passengers mustered, rumors spread. Eventually, the ship's propulsion outright failed. Passengers waited with uncertainty for hours while the crew fought the blaze. By now, however, there was another issue. Without propulsion, the ship was stuck in the Gulf of Mexico. That same day, a cyclone had formed only a few hundred miles from the ship's position. Tropical Storm Harvey was headed directly for the Florida coast, and Tropical was left in its path with no power and no propulsion. Eleven hours had passed before the passengers were given the all clear and could leave the muster stations. At this point, the ship was still without propulsion and limited amenities. Passengers walked around raw sewage in the hallways. Water stopped flowing in cabin sinks, toilets, and showers, but cold, grayish water had been restored to sinks intermittently. To make things worse, the seas were beginning to get choppy. If a ship is moving through the water, its rolling is reduced. But when it sits idle, it's at the mercy of the waves. After the crew managed to get the blaze under control, engineers immediately went to work restoring propulsion. Twelve-foot seas began churning up around the ship, making many passengers outright sick. While the crew tried to quell the mass seasickness, so many people were getting sick from the waves that the damaged ship lacked the means to adequately care for the passengers. 
One woman complained it took several hours for her to track down milk for her 11-month-old son after the fire. Another man had to be airlifted via helicopter from the ship due to medical issues, although it is worth pointing out that that's common practice in the industry. As the night went on and Harvey inched ever closer, the conditions aboard deteriorated. Meanwhile, on land, Carnival spokesperson Tim Gallagher was speaking to the media with conflicting reports from those of the passengers. Gallagher said the ship's facilities were adequate to care for passengers who got sick in 12-foot seas, and pills to avert seasickness were distributed throughout the ship. Gallagher also noted, The vast majority of the time, every passenger aboard had working toilets. Gallagher's statements directly contrast those who were aboard. For 21 grueling hours, the ship was adrift in the Gulf of Mexico, the mercy of the ocean. The crew was eventually able to restart one engine. With one engine operational, the ship finally was able to head for port at a speed of around 7 knots, which is down from a normal cruising speed of 16 knots. As the ship escaped from Tropical Storm Harvey, the waves were reduced, only to about 9 feet, although it's worth pointing out that's still enough to toss a ship around. Long last, after nearly two full days of misery, the Tropical returned to port. Finally, the seasick and disgruntled passengers could be reunited with their families. The CDC, which sent a senior inspector to examine the Tropical after it returned to port, said there were some toilet malfunctions and sewage overflow, but latter limited to one deck. A Coast Guard survey of passengers found that while few passengers felt their lives were in danger, nearly all said there were no fire safety instructions given at the start of their cruise. And that's basically where reporting on the story ends. There were a couple lawsuits that resulted from this, but overall Carnival would move on and go on to have much bigger and greater engine room fires that more people would remember than the Tropical Fire. But I think it's important to point out that it was still a very traumatic experience for a lot of people, and something that the industry can still learn from to this day. Thank you for watching this video on the Carnival Tropical. If you are interested in other cool, unique documentary style videos on ships of various ages, feel free to subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.